Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me in this discussion today, where I'll be exploring relative animal tooth strength with allometry. My name is Olivia Cashin, and I am a biology student at Oglethorpe University. I worked with Dr. Bobby and the Oglethorpe Library faculty in order to put together some research on this topic. Now, truth be told, dental related topics are very near and dear to me. And I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I really wanted to do this presentation on something related to human dentistry until Dr. Bobby made the strict no humans rule for all of us doing the presentation. So I tried to do the next best thing. And in the process, I actually learned, and I do not say this lightly, some very interesting things about not only dentistry, but biology itself. There's much to be gleaned here about the nature of growth and adaptation and many kinds of animals. And I'm really excited to introduce you to an aspect of dentistry, zoology, and developmental biology that you might not be familiar with. You might be asking why something so seemingly narrow and specific warrants a 20 minute discussion. So let me guide you through that with a little bit of intuitive thinking. I'd like you in your mind to imagine the tooth of a bear and compare it to the tooth of a cat. Later on, we'll try to look at the vast range of animals that falls between these two, but for sake of simplicity, please just imagine this bear and cat. I'd be willing to bet that if I had asked you which one you thought was stronger, you would say the bear and by a lot, and you'd be entirely correct. I'm not here to challenge the obvious, but let's make this scientific. If you had to put this idea on a graph, showing that as body weight increases, so does tooth strength using the data from various predators, what do you think the line of this graph would look like? Believe it or not, it is not a straight line or even anything close to that. There's a larger idea in biology that applies on levels as small as a single cell, that there are different needs, advantages, and disadvantages associated with having a larger or smaller surface area to volume ratio, a measure of relative size, which also doesn't increase proportionally, at least in a way that we find intuitive. This is exactly why we're trying to take a critical look at relative animal tooth strength in order to either reaffirm what we know about this principle or maybe even gain a deeper understanding of these pound for pound differences. Now, before you get scared by the figure I'm about to show you here, I want you to just use it as an introductory guide to the size advantage concept that I just told you in the last slide, which from here on out will be referred to as its proper name, allometry. These are of course cubes, but we can connect them to ideas concerning animals, especially if you can imagine the first and last cubes is the cat and bear that we just met in the last slide. The exact numbers themselves are not what's important here, more so the general pattern that we can see in the surface area to volume ratio as size increases. To think of this very simply, and perhaps a little crudely, an animal surface area can be thought of as the bits that we can see, the surfaces that are on the outside of the animal that are touching the air, and the volume of that animal would be all the guts and things on the inside. Well, these guts and things on the inside require constant nourishment in order to sustain. This ratio tells us that bigger animals require more food pound for pound to sustain themselves than smaller ones, which is not favorable for them. You wouldn't want to spend most of your energy, time, and money grocery shopping, and neither does the bear. How do big beasts like this of the world overcome this disadvantage? Nature has its tricks, and the one we'll be exploring today is stronger teeth. Keep this principle in mind as we move forward with the experimental studies, because it explains both the rationale behind their hypotheses and the point of their results. As a brief overview of how this presentation will be organized, just so you have a sense of where we're going with this, we're going to talk about the background, methods, and data of two experimental studies, summarize what we learn, reduce it to a take-home message, and conclude with re references. Our first study was conducted by Patricia Freeman and Cliff Lemon, which they had published in the Journal of Zoology in 2007. With a focus on predators with canine teeth, they had started out this experiment with the goal of finding out if there was a significant pattern when it came to tooth strength as animals increased in size. This is a pretty crucial paper to the point of my presentation, but generally, if you want a sense of papers like this in experimental studies going into it, they usually have a hypothesis where they have an intuitive sense. We know that as animals get bigger, they probably have stronger teeth. But the hypothesis we're starting here with 
is that there's a rhyme and reason behind that. Generally, there's a pattern and maybe a biological explanation for this phenomenon rather than just a guess that maybe a bear has stronger teeth than a cat. The way this paper went about testing their hypothesis was by collecting samples from modern animals, cats, raccoons, bobcats, and others like that. But it's worth noting, and you'll see this in the data slide, that they were able to collect samples from saber-toothed tigers or smilodons. This might be a surprise to you since the big thing about this paper is breaking the teeth in order to test how strong they are. But the reason they had access to saber-toothed tiger teeth is because definitely compared to other extinct animals, their teeth are incredibly easy to come by. They aren't very rare at all. But they made computer models of all of these samples first so they could factor in their shape and size even after pressure testing them. After they broke them, they graphed out the data and compared the strength of the teeth between animals of different sizes. So we know our hypothesis and we know how we're going to go about achieving either disproving that or supporting that. And we've built some fail safes into this plan by computer modeling it as well as breaking it. And we have a pretty solid reason to break these teeth because we can tell how much force we can apply in order to tell just how much it's willing to withstand rather than just having an animal maybe biting into a lot of different kinds of foods and seeing which one sends them to the dentist. How we are able to calculate how much force is applied is by this machine right here called the Instron machine, the one used in this experiment. And it's able to both pull apart and push together any sample that you're willing to test. And the great thing about the Instron is that it can apply a very precise amount of force usually measured in pascals or megapascals. When we can determine exactly how much force a tooth can withstand before breaking, we can use that as a unit of strength. And that's exactly what this experiment was looking for, a measure of strength that we can put on a graph. I included the figure on the left to show how they included a possible confuddling factor for their main goal. The fact that as many animals get older, their teeth uh, get stronger because the inner pulp ca actively calcifies throughout their lifetime. But the main point of this paper is reached with the graph on the right. Here we're seeing that the weight is on the x-axis, the measure that we're using for relative size in this case, and the coefficient used to represent tensile strength is on the y-axis. Don't be fooled by the straight line that we're seeing here. I mentioned in the beginning that this is not we, what we're expecting to see. This graph is actually logarithmic, which can be a little bit deceiving if you don't look closely. The units on the x-axis do not line up in a linear fashion and neither do the y-axis ones. It actually goes from 10 to 100 to 1,000. And on the y-axis, it goes up to 100,000. This sort of graph is done to simplify data. So if we were to put this on the kind of graph we're used to seeing, we would see a very steep upslope which is exactly the pattern we were expecting to see given our previous discussion on allometry. Pound for pound, bigger animals must have stronger teeth in order to aid their hunting and make up for their allometric disadvantage. The big point of this is that we can tell that there's a very predictable relationship found here. And we're able to predict this relationship because we know that in order for a bear to even compete in the different ecosystem niches, it needs to overcome the fact that it needs to eat far more often than maybe a fox needs to. Now moving on to a similar study, but done in a different way. The main author of our second paper, Dr. Francois Therrien, a researcher at Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology, worked with his colleagues to publish the Canadian Journal of Earth Science in January of last year. They came into their experimental study with the goal of either supporting or disproving the idea that there is a pattern that can be found with increasing size and age when it comes to the tooth strength of various dinosaurs. So how exactly did they go about achieving this goal compared to the first paper that we talked about? Well, if you were able to gather from this talk about paleontology and dinosaurs, Dr. Therrien and his team used extinct animal specimens. 
before you look too close at the figures of the right, just know that they're blurry by design. You don't really need all the details there. The point is to show you the way they chose to quantify shape and size. They have all these lines measuring distances between crown and base, mandible length and width, and so on and so forth, so that they can have plenty to work with when it comes to modeling these and determining what their definition of size will be when they're graphing. The equation below that figure, that will be our measure of strength, which in this case, we'll be seeing how close a given tooth will be to the optimal shape for tearing through prey, summarized by a tooth's pointiness and relative size. Unlike our first paper, they did not break the teeth after computer modeling them since, as you can imagine, most extinct specimens are not easy to come by, definitely not so much as a saber-toothed tiger's remains. And even if they had T-Rex teeth to burn, there's the factor that they had been dead for a long time, different amounts of long time between each other, and teeth become more brittle post-mortem. All in all, it would not be a very accurate way of achieving this goal, definitely not as accurate as our last study where they were able to collect fresh samples from raccoon specimens. Other than that, just like before, they collected data, computer modeled it, graphed what they had found, and compared the different sized and aged animals. This may seem like it won't achieve our goal nearly as well as the past one where they were able to physically test with them. But if you are able to change the parameters of your study, like it, for example, of this one, they define strength in a different way. And that's just something to keep in mind as you're comparing these studies and looking at the effectiveness. Um, you, as a reader, have the option to determine how well a study achieved proving or disproving their hypothesis. Right here, we're seeing a dentist in the Air Force using one of several dental modeling systems that exist today. And as you can see, we're able to scan with incredible detail the surfaces of a tooth. Systems like this almost always have the ability to find scale. So with just the drag of the mouse across maybe one plane, the opposite surface, even cross sections that you might not be able to find without sawing a tooth in half. You can find that distance to the 10th of a millimeter with accuracy. And this makes the process of collecting tooth size data much easier, much more scientific, much more reproducible than maybe using a physical ruler or a tape measure, which they might have used in the past. The thought might have crossed, crossed your mind throughout this presentation that there are some assumptions being made with the strength and size idea, and you'd be absolutely correct. These papers make a lot of efforts in order to minimize these assumptions and factor them into their findings. But at the end of the day, we're assuming that the shape and composition of these different samples of teeth aren't preventing us from seeing a pattern that makes sense. I included this graph from our extinct animal paper because although it is not directly related to our main theme today, it gives you a sense of how thorough the authors were in their experiment. What we are looking at here is that the crown to base ratio, which can be thought of as how pointy the tooth is, tends to go down as the animal's jaw gets bigger, which is an indicator of how big the animal is overall. This graph shows us that the bigger the dinosaur, the pointier the tooth, which later on may influence how much stress the tooth might be able to withstand. So efforts like this made by pap the paper might be able to overcome the inability of them to physically test out their hypothesis. All things considered, this is the big smoking gun of this paper. We know that we compare different sized animals from different species to suggest that there's a large scale exponential pattern in nature, but we can also see within a single species as the animal gets older and bigger with shifting dietary demands, their tooth strength also shows this exponential pattern of increase. In the paper, they describe this phenomenon as ontogenetic, which basically means developed sometime between conception and adulthood rather than a trait inherent all throughout an organism's life. So through these two papers, we were able to see that there is a statistically consistent pattern within a species and across a species, which is a huge 
huge development, there was always the idea of comparing cats and bears. And we know that bears are stronger than cats tooth wise, but now we might be able to su suggest something about developmental biology. As you get older, we know the pulp calcifies, but did we know that it was an exponential relationship? And now we do. To summarize what we learned today was that the factors of interest, not including any aforementioned assumptions for tooth strength include age, dietary demands, and size. There were a couple of methods for determining what the pattern would be, including modeling and breaking teeth. However, the interpretation of the data we find through those methods, the way we choose to sh show our findings is pretty consistent. Our authors wanted to use size as an explanatory variable and tooth strength as the variable that is influenced by size, no matter what the author's differing definitions of size and tooth strength happen to be. This is where we get into the idea that tooth shape can be a good predictor of tooth strength. These papers are certainly comparable and they have a lot of similarities, but it's clear that their variables aren't directly analogous to one another because they achieve them different ways and they change their parameters for how they did it. But their findings were relatively the same, which makes this topic so interesting. It shows that there's a lot of potential for looking further into it and maybe looking into different avenues because this is a very narrow topic. It's strictly on canine predators teeth at the end of the day, what I'd like you to get out of this talk is that allometry is a principle that explains a very clear and consistent pattern when it comes to tooth strength in the species included today. We also know now that this pattern is exponential. We are able to discern that allometry is a determinant in the dietary demands that an animal may have, which influences how strong a tooth must become for survival. But more than anything, I want this presentation to get you thinking about its implications and think about what experimental questions these findings can offer us branching out into many other potential experiments. Questions like, how much stronger do your teeth need to be than you? What kind of load do your teeth need to support based on your hunting style or diet? Are genes involved in determining your size associated with genes involved in dental makeup? Does this principle apply to herbivores? What about humans? These are all very interesting and important questions, some of which even may have answers, but it goes to show that the importance of the study is not just in looking at the weight and tooth strength ratios, but asking ourselves what such findings might suggest about other concepts and what questions and new experiments we can gather from the seemingly narrow scope study. I really want this topic to just open the door for others. And while it's really interesting in itself, it gets you thinking about if it's this consistent in something we've only noticed recently in the past, the one paper was in 2007, but in the last 15 years, and the other was just last year. Are there other patterns in biology and in, in nature that are consistent across species in a way that we wouldn't ordinarily predict or expect. Such a, such a finding is not something you'd expect out of just groups of scientists with a geeky interest in teeth sitting together with a hammer, busting them together to see which one might be stronger across the species. But it really goes to show the value of science, not just the big scale Nobel Peace Prize winning scientific achievements, but in tiny things like this can, that can branch out into a lot of other disciplines and subjects. These are the papers that I reference in my presentation today. And should you wish to find any of the figures or read about their experiments for yourself, feel free to pause this video or contact me at oliviacashin at gmail.com with any questions or comments about our topic. Once again, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope this got you curious. I hope this got you thinking and I'm excited to see you next time.